the Irish poet and playwright George Bernard Shaw. You may know George Bernard Shaw as the playwright who wrote the play Pygmalion. It's all about language. It was then adapted for the movies, for the Broadway and for the movies, as My Fair Lady. George Bernard Shaw says, there is a fundamental challenge of all communication. And he said, the biggest challenge of communication is the illusion that it has taken place. Yeah, you can have that one too. The illusion that communication has taken place. And I get complaints all the time from senior people. Senior people on Wall Street, senior people in banking, senior people in healthcare, senior people in uniform. And the complaint I get all the time is, I've told them this. I've told them this. Why aren't they doing what I want them to do? And my answer is, telling them isn't enough. Don't assume that telling them is communication. That you need to engage them. You can't move people until you meet people where they are, and telling people stuff isn't an effective form of communication if all you're doing is telling based on what you want to say. The leadership discipline is saying what you want to say is self-indulgent. Saying what you want to say is selfish, and saying what you want to say is an abrogation of leadership. Effective leaders are rigorous in their communication, not impulsive, not informal, and they don't communicate out of personal preference. They communicate because the outcome is the most likely outcome. The outcome they seek is more likely to be achieved because they communicated with people in a certain way. Communication is the continuation of policy by yet other means. And means can never be considered in isolation from their purposes. Communication is an act of will directed toward a living entity that reacts, and we have to organize our interaction with that living entity in order to provoke the reaction we want. When we do that, we harness the power of communication effectively. When we do that, we avoid the dissipation of that power that leads to lots of churn and very little return on investment. When we do that, we avoid self-inflicted harm. That's what I came to share with you today. I know I'll be meeting with some of you in your smaller meetings later on. We have three minutes and 45 seconds available for questions. And I'll take more questions upstairs. But I'd be happy to take question, comments, complaints, disagreements, whatever you have to offer. Uh, just ask you to raise your hand, and I'll be happy to take whatever you throw at me. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Commander sure. James, submarine warfare officer. Um, I'd like to hear your recommendations on how to combat the natural impulse to be the messenger to the message, to provide c credibility to outside observers, mm -hmm. vice what you discuss in step five of who is the best messenger for the internal credibility. I, I give you great credit for having written down something about step five. That's great. Uh, <clears throat> The question was, and, and keep me honest here, uh, how do I or how does one, okay, how does the leader resist the impulse to say I'm the leader and therefore I ought to be the one speaking? Okay. <clears throat> In the book, I quote a Wall Street Journal columnist named Holman Jenkins. He wrote this about CEOs, but it applies to any person in a position of authority. He says, organizations need defenses against their charismatic leaders. That one seems to strike home. He says, otherwise, those leaders can all too readily bully or seduce others into supporting their vainglorious illusion. You come from a very hierarchical background where those kinds of defenses against charismatic leaders are a little more challenging than in civilian life. To the degree that there's someone withstanding to look at the boss and say, boss, I know you want to exercise your leadership authority and be the primary messenger of this. 
but we have done the research and we have concluded that the change we are hoping to see is more likely if someone else, someone other than you, says it. Or says it in a different sequence. If someone other than you says it, you endorse it. Or you introduce it, somebody else makes the case, and you close it. But what is the optimal outcome we seek, and what is the best way to get that? One of the things I find is when you have done some form of rigorous analysis, and when the boss has already agreed that that analysis is appropriate. So if you say, sir, ma'am, I'd like to prepare to make my recommendation to you on the most optimal way to achieve this outcome, and then you have the analysis, that structured analysis makes courage less necessary. That structured analysis makes it less likely that someone will impulsively push back and say, no, I'm the boss. I'm going to do this. Now, sometimes they will. Sometimes they will. When I prepare the public affairs officers at Defense Information School, one of the things I prepare them for is that their job is to be able to predict the future. And as Yogi Berra said, making predictions is hard, especially when they're about the future. But they can predict the future about how stakeholders are likely to react, because PAOs are experts in stakeholder reaction. So when the boss says, no, I'm going to do it this way, there's a way to say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. I'll support that. But we need to be aware that the likely consequence of that is x. If later the boss can see without somebody saying, see, I told you so, but if later the boss can see, well, you know, that guy, he actually was able to predict the future. Maybe I shouldn't have been the one to say this. It takes a little bit of humility. And I know that's, that's in very high supply at the senior most ranks. But it takes a little bit of humility to be able to see that. But it doesn't take a lot of humility to be able to see that. So, so one of the things that I point to is the planning makes it more likely that the boss can be asked, is, does this actually get us to the outcome you seek, sir? No. The other is if they say, well, I'm going to do it my way anyway is to be able to at least register the likely consequence and see if that consequence comes true. The final thing I always ask my clients, and I suggest that this be a way to think about it, is to never invite the boss to decide based on personal preference, but to always ask the boss to decide based on the predictable outcome. Sir, we have options. We can do it with you as the, the primary speaker. We can anticipate what that reaction will be. We can do it with so-and-so as the primary speaker. And we can predict what the likely outcomes will be. And we can do it with someone else as the primary speaker. And we can predict what those outcomes will be. Sir, ma'am, which of these outcomes gets us closer to the goal we're trying to achieve? And if you can get the boss to, to choose based on the likely outcomes, then you're not challenging the boss's authority you're helping the boss make a smarter decision. It is now two minutes and two seconds past our scheduled adjournment, and I want to honor your time. Uh, thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to getting to know you upstairs. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So in tradition with the Air War College, um, we want to thank you very much um, for coming and presenting to us. You've given us um, some great takeaways. We're always interested. Um, in outside perspectives and a checklist <laughs> Good. is something that's great for us to take away. Thank you. So we oh. would like to coin you and thank you very well, much. Thank you so much, Academic Year 18. Thank you. Thank I you. appreciate it. Thank you all.